Welcome to Lecture 5, Shipper Strategies. In today's lecture, we will be looking at some fundamentals of transportation management, shipper transportation strategies, line aspects of transportation management, and relationship management. So, who is a shipper? A shipper is a person or company responsible for initiating a shipment and may also be responsible for bearing the freight costs. This can be a person sending a package to a friend overseas, can also be a company sending a truckload of cargo overseas. First, look, let's look at what is procurement. Procurement is a wide range of activities focused on obtaining goods and services for the company. It starts with determining the details of what and when the company wants to buy, specifications, quality, pricing, and timing. Then, is the decision of make or buy. Do you make it yourself or buy from someone else? Either way, the company needs to identify supply sources. If you make it, you buy raw materials, otherwise you buy the finished goods. The rest of the process includes examination of legal and regulatory constraints, finances, negotiations, and finally, quality assurance upon receipt of the final goods. Transportation management is just a specialized form of procurement focused on obtaining transportation services for the company. First, you determine the transportation requirements of your products, then you decide whether to buy or lease your resources, and then you figure out who are your suppliers. The rest is essentially the same. Is the objective just to minimize transportation costs? No. It is the objective to minimize total logistics costs. Still not enough. The objective is really to minimize total logistics costs while meeting customer service level expectations. Transportation is usually one of the largest cost elements in the logistics systems. In fact, it can form up to 12.5% of the revenue. As such, decisions in this area can have a very significant impact on the total logistics costs of a company. The number one general strategy is innovation, proactively finding cost-efficient and sophisticated transportation solutions to provide a competitive advantage for the company. The JIT approach to manufacturing might see a manufacturing ma manufacturer maintaining a very low inventory of one day's worth of raw materials, reducing space required, cutting down on cost of inventory, while improving overall cash flow. For this to work, the supplier must have good transportation resources to deliver the right amounts of materials to the factory on a daily basis. The second general strategy is the application of data analytics, gathering and analyzing accurate and current information to facilitate effective planning and control of transportation activities. Examples of such data collected would include transportation costs, shipment volume, carrier performance, etc. The third general strategy is carrier consolidation. When a shipper limits the number of carriers used, each carrier gets a bigger share of the pie. This makes the shipper a more important customer and increases their bargaining power. The shipper also needs to manage fewer relationships spends less time on managing carriers and overall reduce their total costs. The fourth general strategy is based on contracts of services. By locking carriers into fixed contracts of services, the shipper is guaranteed the contracted rates, service levels, and other required conditions for the duration of each contract. The fifth general strategy is negotiation. A shipper's market power and negotiating strength is determined by the characteristics of its freight. A shipper with desirable products will have the upper hand in negotiating with carriers and should utilize this advantage. So what is a desirable product? An example would be something that's high value, difficult to damage, and moves in large volumes regularly. Conversely, undesirable products are low value, easily damaged, or moves in very small volumes. The last general strategy is reviewing or private tracking. Private tracking refers to owning a private fleet of vehicles to manage one's own transportation needs. In today's market, for higher transporters offer competitive rates which are often below that of a private fleet. As such, most shippers are moving towards scrapping private fleets and outsourcing. However, this must be executed with strict control to ensure end customer requirements are still being met in the end. Private operations are only relevant if there are particular special needs that need to be met. The key objective of small shipment strategies is to reduce the inherently high transportation costs associated with multiple small size shipments. Amazon is an example of a small shipment business. In 2017, it shipped 5 billion packages to customers across the globe. 
There are two main small shipment strategies. Number one, consolidation. At point A, the origin, a shipper always tries to consolidate multiple small shipments going to the same consignee or customer into one larger order before sending it to a destination by line haul. At point B, the destination, the consolidated order is delivered to the customer. Strategy number two is pooling. At point A, the shipper consolidates multiple small shipments for different consignees into one large order before signing, sending it to the destination by line haul. At point B, the consolidated order undergoes additional break bulk before each order is delivered to individual customers. The key objective of bulk shipment strategies is to obtain the lowest possible rates while getting guaranteed service levels. An example of a bulk shipment business would be a main, major manufacturer such as Apple. In 2018, Apple shipped 217 million iPhones worldwide. What the consumer sees is a small and stylishly packaged box with an expensive gadget within. What the consumer does not see are the dial cardboard cartons, heavy wooden pallets, and steel unit load devices which are used to ship tons of these precious iPhones around the world. The primary strategy used in transportation or bulk shipments is long-term contracting with real water and motor carriers. The large volume of product move gives the shipper the requisite negotiating and marketing market power to realize lower rates and guaranteed service levels. The only downside of such a mutual dependency is that if a carrier ceases operation, the shipper experiences serious disruptions in service and possibly higher costs because alternatives are not readily available. The shipper can seek to provide the carrier with balanced loads to eliminate empty backhaul costs. This requires coordination between inbound and outbound transportation routes and may not always be possible, especially if dedicated or specialized equipment is required. Successful implementation will be an incentive for carriers to provide better pricing to the shipper. The key objective of reverse logistics strategies is to minimize inconvenience to the end customer while minimizing costs incurred by the company. This is an activity that requires significant transportation activity and corresponding control. This is due to the fact that the goods are usually collected back in very small and loose quantities. They are also often collected from scattered locations. And most importantly, there is often a loss of original packaging, which then requires extensive quality checks to ensure that no defective goods are collected back. Reverse logistics applies to everything and often requires different handling processes. Every product will require vastly different detailed handling processes to facilitate a very smooth reverse logistics flow. In 2017, top British drug maker GSK recorded nearly 600,000 Ventolin asthma inhalers in the US due to a defect that might cause them to deliver fewer doses of the medicine than indicated. It was a painstaking process requiring the local distributors to trace every hospital pharmacy, retailer, and wholesaler that had orders delivered to them and sent drivers to collect back anything that was unsold. In 2016, Toyota Motors recorded 5.8 million cars over potentially 40 airbag inflators. The airbag inflators in question used a chemical compound which could have exploded with excessive force after prolonged exposure to hot conditions and had been linked to 16 deaths globally. The process of tracing every customer who bought a brown car would be as difficult as tracing hospitals. The added challenge would be the transportation of these record cars back to the manufacturer. Reverse logistics can be on ad hoc basis, like that for the asthma inhalers and toilet cars, which hopefully do not happen too often. It can also occur on a continuous basis, such as returns from e-commerce shopping websites and used printer toner cartridges, etc. Zalora is an example of an e-commerce business which has used their returns policy as a key selling point. It has a transport network that allows it to offer a very liberal 30-day free returns policy which has helped to increase sales since shoppers do not have to worry about common e-commerce pain points such as sizing or exchanges. As of 2012, Nespresso had already sold more than 27 billion of its slick aluminum capsules worldwide. Amid its growing concerns about the impact of their product on the environment, in recent years they have put in place a recycling program to encourage customers to return used capsules. All customers need to do is place the used capsules in a recycling bag, hand it over to the delivery person on next order, or drop it off at any Nespresso boutique.
Moving on to the line aspects of transport management, top on the list is shipment planning. One needs to know the exact schedule of required shipments. When are inbound shipments of raw materials due? When are outbound shipments of finished goods due? One also needs to understand the constraints of each stakeholder. Example, size and availability of loading docks will limit the number of containers which can be parked at the facility. Size of staging area and storage capacity will also affect the goods which can be moved at any given time. Next, let's revisit mode selection in greater detail. The first and foremost consideration is accessibility, or the ability of the mode to provide transport service between specific origin and destination. A landlocked country will not be able to utilize shipping directly. A mountainous area with no airport will not be able to utilize air mode. Secondly, we consider capacity. Does a particular mode have the ability to accommodate the volume required and provide the handling necessary? Planes are inherently unsuitable to handle large volumes of liquid commodities such as petroleum. If both accessibility and capacity are satisfied, then it often comes down to the cost. The cost of transportation is usually considered relative to the product. Example, a low-value product is seldom transported by air. When comparing costs, one also has to look at transit time. The total time taken from origin to destination, including any intermodal transfers. In some cases, it may be necessary to select a more costly mode to fulfill customer service expectations. Different modes usually have different levels of reliability, which are country or region specific, since there are different operating environments for carriers everywhere. If a selected mode consistently achieves the promised transit time, the end customer will not need to hold large amount of safety stock. Lastly, security or ability of the mode to ensure shipments do not get lost in transit or suffer damage is of great importance, especially for high value items. High damage or loss rates will lead to stockouts and costs of processing damage claims and even legal action generally all-round convenience for all stakeholders. The decision of modal choice is complex and based on the total cost concept, while ensuring that the goods are basically able to reach the specific destination by a certain time and in a good condition. There are usually cost conflicts or trade-offs, thus it's important to select a mode which minimizes the total cost for a company. Air transport is undoubtedly fast and reliable, but it is also the most expensive. However, the high transportation cost is offset by a lower inventory and warehousing cost. Rail transport is generally low cost, but tends to have higher rates of damage, leading to higher warehousing and inventory costs due to the need for more safety stock. The equilibrium point is different for each situation in each country or region. In some countries such as Indonesia, with more than 17,000 islands over 1.9 million square kilometers, air transport has become an important part of life for moving both people and cargo. Despite the relatively high cost, it is sometimes the only reliable means by which people in these islands can obtain essential goods. At the moment, there are no fewer than 20 domestic airlines serving the 260 million population of Indonesia. When people think of shipping, they usually think of ships sailing in the open seas. Rivers also form a critical part of the water transportation system. For example, the Mekong River is one of the world's great river systems, flowing 4,909 kilometers through six countries. Since historical times, it has played a key role in trade and transportation through these countries long before highways or air routes came along. For carrier selection, the same selection factors for mode selection are considered. Some additional factors include financial security of the carrier, possession of special equipment, global track and trace capability, claims processing capability and after sales service. The ordering service simply refers to the shipper providing shipment details for the carrier to make necessary arrangements. Example, product type, weight, size, pickup, delivery locations, etc. Expediting and tracking just refers to the shipper either licensing the carrier or assessing web-based systems to track their shipments. An important aspect of transportation management is controlling the costs incurred in the detention demarrage process. Since containers are assets belonging to a carrier, there will be penalty charges incurred for keeping them for loading or unloading beyond the specific period determined by the contracts of service. If it is delayed at the port, the penalty charges are known as demarrage charges. If it is delayed at the shipper's premise, it is known as detention. Loss and damage sometimes occurs in shipments due to the various transportation periods. When this happens, 
The recipient of cargo must first initiate a survey of the damaged cargo to assess the cost impact. Then the insurance claim is submitted to the insurance company. The entire process to process the claim and issue compensation is often a long one. A shipper must develop a good relationship with his carriers since they are the means by which the products can reach the destination markets. The carriers are critical for assuring quality and continuity of the transport service at the lowest total cost. There are many types of buyer-seller relationships which a shipper can seek to establish with their carriers. For what is known as the arm's length relationship, it is often based on a one-off transaction. Price is the main deciding factor and the carrier service is usually a standard offering. Example is a one-time bus transport for a family day event that maybe happens only once every five years. In a type 1 relationship, there's only a short-term contractual relationship. There may be some mutual sharing of information, risks and rewards, but there's usually a limited scope of activities requiring very little investment by both parties. An example of this is a one-year truckload service with a fixed schedule, standard volume and rates. A type 2 relationship is a longer-term contractual relationship. This takes a longer time to develop and there is a need to build trust and commitment. There will be a broader scope of activities possible and may require investment of time and effort from both parties. An example is a multi-year contract for all Asian freight lanes with a guaranteed volume and performance incentives. A type 3 relationship is based on an evergreen contract with no formal endpoint. Unless one party calls it quits, the contract will continue in perpetuity. By this stage, there will be substantial joint ownership of assets and sharing activities. A higher level of risk and investment for both parties is involved. An example will be a dedicated transportation fleet and other resources for pick-up and shipper locations, brick bulk, etc. In a joint venture, both parties get together to create another company. This is, of course, meant to be long-term in nature and requires significant investment. The objectives of such a move is for each party to benefit from the expertise of the other. It can take the form of merger of two companies or an acquisition of one company by another, which allows the resources of both companies to be combined and synergized in the same organization. Finally, in vertical integration, a company may decide to build their own private fleet on the basis of costs and service levels required for their end customers. The new subsidiary can handle the transportation activities on a dedicated basis rather than using external carriers. For example, in 2015, Amazon set up their own logistics company in India, Amazon Transportation Services, to deliver products to their clients rather than depend on an assortment of more than 10 different carriers. The Alibaba Group, parent company of the world's leading online marketplace Taobao, was even more ambitious. In 2013, they launched Tainiao Smart Logistics Network together with eight other top Chinese logistics companies, the aim of providing 24-hour delivery across China, 72-hour delivery worldwide. China processes 100 million packages a day. Ultimately, each type of business relationship has its appropriate application. It is important to determine the appropriate relation fit for each context in order to attain the best outcome for each company. With that, we have come to the end of Lecture 5. See you next time! Mm -hmm.